Hey, how's it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of The Right Stuff. I'm Josh Hayes, here with my co-host, the always-on-topic, never-multitasking Scott Moon. And today we are celebrating kind of a milestone here on Keystroke Medium. It's our six-month anniversary. Everybody clap. Yeah, yes. Yay. So we're celebrating, uh, kicking off this milestone, and we're kicking our celebration up a notch by welcoming back uh, past guest fantasy author Jacob Cooper and master of science fiction and the author of the Rune Load series, David Farland. Uh, welcome to the show, Jacob and David. Well, thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh it's a real honor for me to talk to you, uh, Dave, because I've followed your work for a, a long time, and not just your fiction, but uh, how to write fiction. Um, and uh, one of your students is my all-time favorite author, and that's uh, Brandon Sanderson. So thank you for the great work that you do. Well, thank you. Uh, so we wanted to kick it off kind of with a bang. Uh, I just mentioned here previously that we that you and Jacob have worked together on his series. Uh, in the Right Stuff show, we like to talk about craft and how to improve an author's writing. Um, and you have worked with Jacob on his uh, Dying Land Chronicle um, from his prequel and his first book, The Circle of Rain. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, first of all, uh, Jacob, can you tell us kind of what, led to that uh, meeting and then David if you want to talk about a little bit about the the major points that you guys worked on in the manuscript well it, I mean what led to it was a lot of persistence on my part <clears throat> to convince Dave he needed to carve out some time for me <laughs> and uh, you know I mean Dave's in Australia right now he's uh, every time I emailed him or talked to him he was in a different part of the world and uh, it's funny because we live in the same town so I thought this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be one of those things where if if um, I can work with him, it should be fairly easy. And and little did I know, and it wasn't hard. It was just a, a tough time getting schedules together. Right. But you know, I persisted with uh, with Dave. I am a fan of his work. I'm a fan of his students' work. Um, and, and I had a goal that I wanted to write like Brandon Sanderson, to write like Patrick Rothfuss. And these are the exact things I told Dave about why I want to work directly with him. And a couple times Dave said, take my class. And so I sat in on a few and things like that. But I, I am just that guy that wants to go straight to the source and have a one-on-one -on -one relationship if I can at all possible. And yeah. uh, after many months, uh, Dave uh, was able to carve out some time in his schedule and he read the first 30 to 50 pages. And, and then, Dave, you sent me an email and said, hold on here. You asked me to do a light edit for you because the books had already been released, you know. Right. <laughs> and, and asked me to do a light edit. And, and, Dave, you said to me, what is your goal here? And, and that's when I really said, well, I want to write like Sanderson or Rothfuss. I, I, I know I'm not at that level, but I believe that I can be. And I was very flattered when Dave came back and said, you know, what? I really see it in you. There are some weaknesses, make no doubt, but I really see that there's a kernel in you uh, uh, that can really be nourished. And that's that's why he stopped and said, wait a minute, what's your goal here? Um, because I, I my impression was is that the writing was uh, in its embryonic state, but I think that he saw a, a very good potential. And so... I clarified with him that what, what my goals were, and I gave him permission to be as brutal, brutally honest as <laughs> he wanted to be. Do your worst. And you gotta, you gotta remember, I'm the son of a marine. I thrive on the brutal, harsh honesty, <laughs> and, uh, and and Dave was brutally honest, and 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 I, you know, some of the side notes as I got edits back, back for him were literally, "This is crap." Like, <laughs> that is exactly Thank what you. I needed to hear. I mean, you know, it's like, no, I, I really. And, and there were plenty of good encouragements along the way, too. I don't want to make it sound like it was just a drill instructor session. Right. But I I thrive on the brutal honesty. And when someone gives a review and says, ah, this was, wasn't for me, it was weak writing, well, where? Tell me. Help me. You right. know? And, yeah. and so, anyway, that's what I needed, needed Dave for. And, and Dave was very good at that. And I cannot tell you, and we'll go through some of the ruminations, I'm sure, but I can't tell you how many just levels of above the book is right now um compared to where it was and well let, and, let's and hit some of those so, so yeah. dave when you when he asked you that question i don't know if you remember back that far um what were you expecting as an answer or what maybe what are some other answers 
people have given you when you when you ask them what are you trying to achieve here well what i really look for um quite frankly from an author is uh is is honesty you know if if they don't say i want to be the very best that there is then they're lying to me okay <laughs> and uh and i and i don't like that shit We'll put it that way. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. when, when, Jacob, when Jacob said, okay, I want to be writing at this level, I said, good, because you're just about there. You know, you're not, you're not very far away. And that's the other thing that I like. Um, if, if I'm working with an author and the author sends me something, they really have no hope uh, of, of jumping to that level, you know, on this edit, then um, right. I, I, I don't want to be the person who's taking their money, I guess is the way to put it. Right. Uh, so I'm looking for authors who really are uh, trying to achieve something. When I worked with Brandon Sanderson, for example, you know, Brandon had written half a dozen novels, and uh, and I didn't know it. He turned in his first uh, his first assignment for my writing class, and it was the first chapter of Elantris. And I said, uh, if you keep writing at this level, not only will I give you an A, I'll give you a cover quote when you get your book done. And Very uh, nice. at that point, uh, he came back to me and said, you know. Um, so what do I have to do? And we just started outlining what he was going to have to do to make this a, a career. With Stephanie Meyer, when she took my writing class, she came in um, probably the third class and said, uh, I need to have a, a counseling session with you. And I said, okay. And she said, what do I do to become the best-selling young adult writer of all time? And that's the, that's the kind of Quite frankly, uh, that's the kind of honesty I want from a person. You know, if they really want it and they want to know how to do it, then I'm happy to talk to them. And and so Jacob came to you with this project and wanted your help. And he he mentioned that you there was some weaknesses that you found. Can you do you remember like, going back? Do you remember some of the weaknesses that you can think of? I knew I was going to become a punching bag. So this, this yeah, is okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for and, volunteering. Uh, we won't we won't whip J Jacob to death on the show. I'm just curious to see af, uh, what what kind of changes that you made that that you see that would make his work the way you want it, the way it, it should be to be a best selling book. Well, the prose the prose itself was uh, was pretty darn good. I liked his style and uh, uh, his problem. Uh, the, the only few things I really saw were um, when you get into storytelling, uh, he seemed to wander in certain places and he would leave clues about upcoming mysteries and things like that. And sometimes it just didn't, uh, it didn't drag you kicking and screaming through the story. I always look for a scene to, um, to really uh, basically make you just have to read it okay there need to be hooks at the beginning and at the end it needs to have action that is uh that, that basically expands the story keeps it moving along not nothing that reiterates something that's already happened or you know uh recapsulate recapsulates it or something like that right. and so i wanted to i wanted the story to just really be moving so that was one of the things um Sometimes when you're writing a big novel like this, especially, what happens is that, uh, you know, you, you're writing, and when you're writing, you write with both sides of your brain, the left and the right hemisphere, the creative part and the intellectual part. Well, that creative part of your brain tends to go to sleep at times. It just t kind of takes a rest. And when that happens, your writing uh, seriously goes downhill, okay? It, you, you don't realize it because you're only writing on half a brain. It feels like you're getting a lot done, uh, but but you tend to write crap. And so with Jacob, I just said, you know, you're writing crap right here. <laughs> and I would say, take out this scene. We need to do this. We need to fix this scene by 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 doing something like this. And uh, you know, I'm I'm not the only one who says it. It was um, you know, it was uh, uh, gosh, who was it? It was Heinlein who said that every writer needs to have a solid gold shit detector. <laughs> okay, and, and that like means that. that when you when you do something wrong, you know you need to be able to find it. Well, sometimes that solid gold shit detector is built inside of you, and you've got the own your own literary sensibilities, and they'll tell you that hey, I did something wrong, and you can go back and fix it. Other times, it might be a wife or a uh, another wise reader, you know, who comes through and looks at it and says, okay, you really need to fix this, hon. 
and uh, and you do it. I don't believe that uh, it helps me as an editor or it helps the writer when I'm too gentle at that point. You know, right. I try to sidestep the issues and say you, you know, you really have to fix this. You know, it really does have to be fixed. Right. Well, that's good because uh, I think. Uh, sometimes that is is tough to do uh, when you have like writing groups and and you you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, but you read something and you're like, ah, man, that's that's really bad. But it's good. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, At what point do you set it aside for a little bit and come back to it, or or is that stuff going to be just as evident that it's bad when you're in the middle of your draft, or is there an advantage for you know maybe sleeping on it and coming back and rereading it the next day? I will. Uh, I I usually um, will go. Uh, if I see it in my own work, I go fix it immediately. If I see it in somebody else's, um, it usually takes me about two days to work up the nerve to actually go back and say, "Okay, we, you really got to fix this," you know. And I, I think about it and I think about it until I finally say, "Okay, this there, there's there's no saving this particular scene." For example, um, you just need to cut this one. And uh, and speed up the pacing. So there's there's little things like that, and um, and every writer does it just about. You know, I, I rarely find when I look at a story, there's three things that I'm looking for. The first thing that I'm looking for is the concept of the story, and sometimes you know a scene will have its own concept uh, about what you're trying to accomplish with it. The second thing I look at is you know does it have some interesting twists and turns is the story itself working do you set it up properly do you introduce your characters and your setting and everything the way that we should and then the third thing that i look for is do you tell it beautifully and every author it seems has you know one area of weakness where they're going to fall down it might be in their storytelling it might be in their conceptualization of a scene or of a story um, or it might just be in little things like, you know, their stylistic details. But, uh, but the goal is to try to help us uh, really put the entire package together. Right. Now, I was listening to uh, one of your other podcasts. I can't remember what show it was. But you were mentioning, um, I heard two different type of edits, and there's probably more. Triage edits and then descriptive, descriptive edits that you go through in a, in a manuscript when you're working on it. And... Uh, it was interesting There's to me. More. Go ahead. Oh, I said yes. There are more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but the the one those are the two that hit me uh, the most in the description edits. It was interesting because um, you write a scene, and the way you were describing it is you write a scene. Uh, say that there's a, a, a tsunami or a flood water coming in, and and then you go back, and when you're doing a description edit on that scene, you would fill in. Uh, do I smell water here? Is it wet? Um, what's the sound of the water doing and all that stuff to put it, make sure that that stuff is written in the scene. So it's a full complete scene when you read it. And I never thought about developing a scene like that. Uh, is that, is that one of the, is that one of the big, biggest challenges for beginning writers that you see is going through and getting the, the whole feel, the whole experience in to writing a scene or writing a book? Yeah, um, you know, when a, when a new writer comes in, very often they'll imagine a scene and they don't report on what they imagine, okay? That might be one problem. So, for example, they might imagine that, um, you know, father came charging toward me. But as a reader, I don't know who father is, you know, are you talking about a father Catholic priest? Are you talking about your father? What does your father look like? You know, how old are you? How big are you? What does he smell like? Uh, what does he sound like when he comes towards you? Is he stomping his feet? Is he, you know, uh, snapping his bullwhip? You know, all sorts of things like that that come in that the author uh, maybe didn't tell us. And then there's the authors that don't even imagine things okay so for example when you say father scream such and such and you don't tell us what the father's voice sounds like because the author doesn't even bother imagining that uh, they aren't aware of it some authors for example are nose blind and so they never relate smells ever period okay and other authors uh, have weak eyesight and so they may uh, forget to tell us what is in the background in a scene. Is the moon up? Is there mountains in the distance? You know, things like that. 
So it's a matter of looking at what the author's done and saying, okay, uh, you're not quite, you're not quite visualizing it for us you're not bringing it to life we've got to bring it to life by giving us the sensory details and those are just some of the problems in editing that's that's when i get into the descriptive editing you know i want to say what does it set what does it sound like what does it smell like what does it feel like what does it taste like um all of those all everything has to come into it and you have to get body movement in uh what is your character doing um if you can do that then you can transport a reader to the point that they become hypnotized and they forget that you're even that they're even reading, and that's one of the goals that I have with a story. You know, as a if I can, uh, while Dave was going through Circle of Rain, the beginning of that book, you know how when you're writing a book, you go through the first I don't know maybe it's thirty to fifty pages, and it's the beginning, and that part is so polished and it really. Is designed to hook a reader really well, yeah. and I and I I got some advice earlier on, very similar to what Dave is saying, and put the reader in the scene, use the five senses, and so I did that, and then as the book went on and Dave continued to edit, every time a point of view shifted or a new chapter, um, especially past the first third of the book, Dave would always say, "Set the scene." I I I don't know anything about this scene. And several times I was like, wait a minute, but you already know the character, you already know some of what's happened. And I was relying, I was resting on those laurels of the previous development that I have done. And so now with the rewrite of Circle of Rain and, and Dave's encouragement, you know, just about every scene is, is, is really set very well and what it does smell like, feel like, taste like, and temperature and what time of day it is and that, that kind of thing. And so I, I could just tell you, I, I recognize from the rewrite of what Dave was doing. He was coaching me that exactly what he was just saying. Um, and I, and I got a little one here saying hi. Hi. And <laughs> she just brought me dinner. Um, <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I really enjoyed, um, being challenged on that level by Dave is to, to put the reader in every single scene and don't get lazy. It is so easy to get lazy, yeah. especially in a book that, um, you know, we set out to cut about 50,000 words, and uh, I'm not sure Dave knows this, but, I mean, it was 180 when we started. We cut about 35,000, but it ended up being 216,000 in the end. Sorry, Dave. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Whatever it but, takes. But a lot of that, you know, a lot of that just came from, and we did cut a lot. We cut a lot. But a lot of it came from make me feel this, make me hear this, make me taste this. And that's what a lot of the extra language was, and I discovered in becoming a better author through this process that a lot of times it takes one to three sentences and that's all it takes. And they can be very pointed and everything and, and show don't tell it a lot, but you can show it in one to three sentences and totally set a scene very well. And that was excellent practice for me being challenged like that. That brings up a quick question. Listen to you talk about that. When you're going through this, this um, kind of experience in your scene, does that ever change your plot or story? Because you are got somehow a deeper connection. Does it ever take you in a new place based on which? Yes, I, no, I, I, personally, all the time. Lots of new scenes came because I was setting a scene and something just came to me and I was like, I have to discover that angle. I have to take that off ramp. And Dave, I'll, 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 that, the answer is yes for me and I'll let uh, Dave speak here. No, he's absolutely right. Um, a, a lot of the problem that comes with new writers is that. Um, when they are uh, when they're imagineering their story, you know, and they're initially trying to put it together in their imaginations, uh, they do a pretty good job. You know, they'll go through and they'll say, "Oh, this is going to happen, and that's going to happen." But as you get deeper into writing it, you start discovering character motivations and their past histories, and and building their voices and creating their world. All of a sudden, you start realizing that there's little ramifications. There are things that that need to come in that I hadn't really anticipated. And so this story starts expanding and, and that's exactly, uh, that's exactly what we had to do. And when you guys went through, uh, looking at his story and like uh, when I go through a past scene, I look at it and read it and then make notes off to the side and have some kind of a, a checklist to make sure that I'm hitting the main points that I want. Is that what you kind of did? Or is that what you recommend to do when you go back and look at these, things these immersion points and say did we get did we get smell did we get 
what it sounds like? Did we get the feeling and, and you check every scene like that as you go through your... Yeah, I go through the scene and I look for a number of things. I, I ask myself, does this scene hook me at the opening in some way? And I have lessons on how to write hooks for scenes. And so I've got about nine different types of hooks that they can go through and so that we vary the types of hooks for each scene and see if we can come up with one that's appropriate. And then I say, do we set the scene well? Do I know where and when it's happening? Who's going to be in the scene? Uh, what the time of day is? What's going on? Those types of things. And those can be added, as Jacob said, pretty easily. Yeah. And then I look at it and I say, <coughs> okay, does something, does this scene accomplish something? Does it move the story forward? And I want to get that done. So on the scene level, I'm looking at that. Uh, and then at the end, um, I want to know, does it hook me so that I want to keep reading to the next scene so that I don't think about, oh, it's a good time to go to the bathroom or call my mother or uh, go to the hospital or <laughs> right. whatever it is that you have to do. Um, and so those are, those are some of the main questions that I ask. But I also look at things like how well does this, uh, for example, there's, if there's a conversation, you know, does this explicate your themes that you're dealing with in the story? Uh, that might be an important point. Um, uh, so I want to make sure the themes, by the way, are, are how the reader attaches to a story and, and finds that, you know, you may start reading off about somebody else, but eventually you start getting to a point where you recognize that the story is about you, you the reader, you know? Right. And, and uh, so we try to bridge uh, that gap between the writer and the reader and the story uh, and the author by talking about things that really are important to the author ultimately, or to the reader ultimately, I should say. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I, when in my writing, I have a an issue with slowing the action down but keeping it uh, pertinent to the story. For instance, I can read uh, uh, the Final Empire and still be intrigued when Vin is at the ball with uh, Alan Venture, where there's no action and nobody's getting killed, uh, mm -hmm. or they're not learning about Alamancy or anything like that. It's just they're talking about their relationship. Um, that is one of the hardest things that I've found as a writer to kind of expound upon in the story. I know that I want to know my characters. I know that I want to present this to the reader and say, these are the characters, these are the thoughts. And I have an, it, uh, my, my hardest thing is making the reader care about the character enough that they're going to want to read this part. Um, yeah. Have you found in a, 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 not a simple way, but a, a good way of kind of writing that type of a scene where it's not a you know somebody's not getting killed and we're not having a big action scene where you're just building the character is that something that you have uh been able to create how do you do that and keep the reader involved in, in what's going on there's a number of different kinds of readers and, and they may be looking for different things okay so when you're read when you're writing you have to remember that some people for example, are looking for escape. And so they want a lot of world building. And so as you start describing, for example, the costumes of characters or the city that they're in or the customs in a strange land, uh, these people become absolutely riveted in the story. Other people are very interested in mysteries. So if I have a character who's thinking about a mystery, trying to uncover the, the a solution to a problem or something, um, there are people who get really involved in that. Uh, there are other people who are uh, really interested in the romance line of your story. So, for example, your female readers might be really interested in a romance line. And so as I get in and I have a man and a woman talking, what I do is I try to write each scene that way so that, that I'm appealing to that readership. I want them to go, oh, this is great. And what generally happens is that if, a, if any reader gets in a story, even if they really aren't into the mysteries, by the time that you've created the characters and the world and the situation, and then you start talking about a mystery, they might not be a person who normally reads mysteries, but uh, I think that they'll typically be excited by it. Maybe they'll find that they like this part better than they liked any of the other parts, and they just, you know, they're just being introduced to something new. So uh, my goal is to, to really try to appeal to you know, a dozen different kinds of readers with every story that I tell. 
Um, How important is it to know some of these things? I'm going to back up two questions. Go for it. To know some of these in advance, like uh, how important is it to know your theme in advance or does it grow or your readership? And do you pick a group or try to hit as many groups as you can, as widely as you can? Um, so it's kind of a, a whole hodgepodge of questions there. Just yeah. throw them out there. Okay. Well, like, Scott, I think that for me um, – uh, when I begin writing a novel, I generally know kind of who the audience is. Uh, the audience is people like me, uh, who are big fantasy fans, for example. Uh, I, I usually assume that they're a little bit smarter than the average bird, um, and uh, and this kind of thing. With the themes, though, I, I tend to just sort of discover those as I go. You know, I suddenly I'll be sitting there and I'll say, now wait a minute, I've been writing about the theme of uh, you know, uh, should a good man kill somebody else? Uh, you know, in the in in the name of of trying to put his own uh, uh, mores further, uh, something like that. And I'll say, hey, I've been I've I've had three characters discuss this in the first fifty pages. Guess what? This is the theme to the novel, and I just didn't know it when I started. So I I tend to discover that. As far as the audience goes. Um, I try to do an audience analysis uh, up front. I want to try to capture male readers and female readers and old and young. So I tend to have some uh, protagonists in groups in my novels, and, uh, and hopefully that will help me do that. Um, but, you know, that's not the only way to write. There are, there are other ways to do it. When Stephanie Meyer wanted to write the best-selling young adult fantasy of all time, I told her to... Uh, or, or uh, young adult yeah, uh, kind of story of all time. I told her that she should be writing a romance slash um, wonder story, you know. And so we sat down and and outlined what she needed to do on the next steps, you know. Uh, where is it going to take place? Uh, what's the story going to be about? And uh, these types of things. And when you talk about wonder, you're talking about the wonder of being wonder drawn to the story exploration or something like that? Uh, wonder is is uh, comes about when you experience something new, and particularly when it turns out to be something new and good. If you uh, if you experience something new and it's terrifying, it can be a it can be a horror story. Okay, uh, but but wonder is uh, a really a branch of literature that uh, that is especially appealing to young people. Um, right. There's one editor at one point used to say that we shouldn't have a science fiction and fantasy category; that it should be called wonder literature, because when you go to a when you go to a bookstore and you start looking at what the genres are, you'll have horror, you'll have romance, you'll have humor, um, you'll have science fiction, fantasy. Those are wonder, okay? And right. uh, and really, what we're doing is we're selling books based upon what's the primary emotion that they arouse. And so, wonder literature is a is a category of literature that uh, we just don't use the proper name for. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. When when you put it that way, I'm like, oh, I see where you're going with this. And also, it also is interesting to me that wonder and mystery are two totally different things. Yes, they are. It may be complementary. But, but, yeah, w wonder is is where you go. You know, when you're a kid and you're reading a comic book and you're reading about Superman and you go. Ooh, how cool would it be to have his strength and to fly around? You know, uh, that's where you're wondering about what it would be like if. You know, what if? Uh, if you're reading mystery, um, you know, then you're reading what's what happened. You know, what what the, what in the world is going on? And so it's a slightly different kind of it's a different uh, connotation of wonder. <laughs> I want to kind of uh, take a different cool. direction here for a few minutes and. Uh, 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 Jacob, Scott, and I are all relatively uh, rookie authors in the field of uh, writing fiction. Obviously, you've been doing it for a really long time and are very successful at it. Um, when we talk about structure or story building, do you have a, uh, a solid way that you go about taking, you have an idea and a cool concept for a novel, um, but no novel. You just have this idea. Um, how how do you take that idea and turn it into a novel that works and a novel that people are going to read? I think he's talking to you, Jacob. Are you talking oh, yeah. to Jacob? Oh, either one. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I thought you were talking to Jacob. Oh, okay. 
Well, we're for, always talking to Jacob in some for, uh, part of our subconscious. <laughs> yes, I am there. Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess for me, I have to. Um, I, I used to just say I'm discovery writer. That's it. Um, and and I use discovery writing, I think, to discover now a theme or a character. I, I take a if I have an idea for a character, for example, I have a series of what if this, what if that, what if that. How would the character respond or think about these situations? And there's a dozen to two dozen of them that I create answers for, and that helps me create um, a character. And it could be as something as silly as um, what if this character won tickets to the World Series? Um, does this character like pineapple? Uh, what if this character got, uh, passed someone having a flat tire? What if this character got a flat tire? And it doesn't matter. I mean, like like Rain is my main protagonist in my in my stories, Circle of Rain. But and she doesn't obviously live in a time um, if you've read the books at all where they have tires right. and cars. Doesn't matter. I still answer the question, and it helps me develop a character. And so, uh, to maybe to more specifically get to it, if I have a neat idea and. Um, that I that I like to develop, I will discover your right around that idea, and it's very likely that none of that will make it into the into the actual manuscript. However, it lets me test the idea. It's kind of my litmus test, and if I like where it's going, then I'm going to outline the thing. Um, it's a flexible outline for me. I'm never so rigid that I can't take an off ramp, discover a little bit, and then come back to the main uh, that that main um, outline. Right. Um, but that that's how I. Uh, have grown to doing it and I think that's also why I went when I wrote Circle of Rain it, some of that is why it took five years to publish and some of the answer is I wasn't writing full time but regardless right. right after I wrote Circle of Rain I went back and wrote the prequel or the prelude Altar of Influence and that took me eight months and that's because I outlined that thing and and I've gotten a lot more um, the, the people who were critical of Circle of Rain found altar of influence, uh, they were much less critical of it. And I think that there was something to do, not everything. I think some of it was, I was also a little more experienced. But I think a lot of it was to do with, yeah, I outlined and I stayed to a theme and I had tested it a little bit on my own. And I thought it was very succinct and a very quickly written story um, that had a very clear series of hooks all the way through. And, and I was able to seed it well because I had outlined it fairly well and I, I will say that I did discover a lot of things along the way despite the fact that it was outlined but I always had something to go back to once I was done discovering a new part or, or new scene right yeah and, and I listened to the audio version and I like the story a lot um, the only thing that I had issues not issues with but trouble uh, grabbing right at the beginning of the book was because it was an audio form I couldn't see the dates so I had it was yeah. it, it it jumps a lot, but I get it like you were doing like period shots of their life building what was gonna come later in the story, but because I was listening to the audio version, I was like, is that the date he said the last time or? With, but it was with alter of influence, yeah, and I, yeah. I do jump through their childhood pretty quick, um, and, and you're right, and you know that's probably a weakness of mine where I relied, I, I, I said to myself, well, I got the date at the beginning of the chapter. It's right here, so everyone should be good. And I, I probably should have seeded that into the the writing a little bit more. In well, in and, no, and I thought it comes to point. It was comes to point for me as a reader where I I, I will it, once I'm you know say twenty percent deep into the story, I'm much more willing to figure that stuff out, you know, and go back. And you don't have to because some some writers some writers it, it's it'd be too much to tell me every time. I don't need to know every time. I can I can jog my memory yeah. or something and well and, and it was like that. it was it was nice because you like i knew that you knew what you were doing like you had yeah. the the seasons and you know fourth moon of second rising or or however that you had it in the the, the story so i knew and by probably about by the fifth or sixth time that that happened i was paying attention to the year and what season they were in so I could follow mm -hmm. that. And then I was following it when I started to realize how fast we were jumping through their lives. Uh, and then I started circle of rain and immediately went, nah, <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers, no spoilers. Um, <clears throat> um, I think we talked a little bit about that without, 
the details what you guys are referring to with the surprise and another um yeah maybe that was off camera i can't remember i remember you guys talking about that well and D D dave dave has been through circle of rain uh thoroughly he he didn't really go through alter of influence but you know mm -hmm. dave Samuel, right rain's dad is the hero in altar of influences his backstory and so you know what happens in the beginning of circle of rain and that's why josh went what yeah <laughs> yeah because yeah, yeah. yeah, i read it out of order i read the i listened to the prelude first it's, it's not out of how is that out of well order? okay it's not out of order but out of publication order i was well, yeah um and then i immediately texted him i was like i can't believe this happened um but david in your in your rune lord series you're you're on you finished the ninth book is it out Yet? I'm almost done with my with the ninth book. Um, you know, actually, on my plane flight over here, I was thinking about some things I'd like to do, and I, I may have just uh, doubled the length of it. But uh -oh. uh, I've got about 600 pages written. Uh, <laughs> but I realized that I really want to do something cool with this, and uh, so I, I think I may end up adding another 400 pages or something. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I'm I'm getting close. So put it that way. And with your a nine book series is a pretty big. Uh, pretty big project to jump into did you have it uh all planned out from beginning to end or no i i originally planned on doing a, a just a trilogy which turned into four books okay and uh and so i actually wrote the rune lord series i i considered that to be the fourth uh you know the first four books but then when i got done my editors wanted more rune lords books and i said okay well i'll do another series set in the world we'll go and We'll go to their children, and we'll write one about the, the kids' adventures. Um, and uh, then when they put it out, instead of starting a new series under a different name, uh, they said, this is Rune Lord's book five. And <laughs> <laughs> so a lot Thank of people you. looked at it and said, uh, now, wait a minute. Uh, didn't that end? Didn't that series end? What's this book five? You know, and uh, yeah. Anyway, so they've been a little bit slower to pick up the, the series, but then the people who are reading the new series are kind of going, wow, this is different from any fantasy I've read before, and I have no clue where you're going, and that was one of the things I wanted was to be to write a series that was original enough that it didn't feel like it was another Lord of the Rings or something like that. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I wanted some a, a sense. See, I think that a sense of wonder can only come when you actually – encounter something strange and if you're reading books that are like lord of the rings and they're too much like lord of the rings well, what you're getting is a sense of nostalgia you know oh i love lord of the rings so much and i love mm -hmm. reading another one that's just like it and you know um i wanted to do something different i wanted to take it in a direction that people hadn't seen before absolutely i uh scott likes to do that in a lot of his books where he'll take um He'll take uh, uh, um, like his dragon, uh, dragon badge books. Yeah, basically takes a uh, like a police kind of uh, contemporary setting and then throws wizards and dragons in it and just mm -hmm. sh like just bombards you with a, a cross genre uh, thing that is very unique and you know you've never read anything like that. Um, uh, take and that's a trope and go the other way. Like exactly. This. What's the opposite of this trope? And we'll start from there. <laughs> Well, that's, I think yeah, that's exactly. which sometimes is okay. Sometimes it's just a recipe for banging your face on a wall. But you well, know. tropes okay. are good uh, when they're used, you know, correctly and not overused. I uh, I'm kind of getting dissatisfied with a particular genre right now on Amazon where it's it's all uh, one spaceship against an entire alien armada, and that's like every story that's in military science fiction right now, and that's it's very like. You know, it's overdone with the the old crouchy captain and the the crew that knows everything. I like, kind of like an Enterprise or, or whatever, and uh, I'd like to see some some original, uh, not original, but higher concept stories. I guess is what I'm going like like what Mistborn did for fantasy with Alamancy. Uh, I'd like to see something like that in in the science fiction genre. But you were a you science know, fiction writer too. You know, you say mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, Josh, what Miss Bourne did for fantasy, I, and I think the magic system. If you look at it, and then you look at Rune Lords. Um, when I when I listened to Rune Lords, I I was like, I see some earlier influence here that that I think Sanderson may have may have used a little. Maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe Sanderson yeah. already wrote it. But anyway, I I sensed a very close kinship in in some of the magic systems, and I, I thought it was really neat. Yeah, actually. 
Well, actually, when Brandon took my class, he said the reason he took my class was because he had loved the Rune Lords and he wanted to figure out how to do magic systems like there I do. And so there, there is, I, I think there is an influence. Um, I think Brandon's did it beautifully, you know, wonderful job. Uh, all, all accolades for him, uh, you know, quite frankly. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I remember when we, uh, when we first went out, uh, and started doing book tours together. Uh, Brandon and I went and did book tours together. So he gave us a month to just talk about writing while we were driving, you know, down through California and Nevada and Utah and up the Oregon coast and into Washington and then back over into Idaho and uh, and then into Colorado. You know, uh, we would just talk about writing for an entire month. So uh, certainly we have, uh, I, I've had a bit of influence on Brandon <laughs> in a number of ways. <laughs> And we did that for five years, so uh, so it was a lot of fun. How to be alone in a car for a month talking about writing. Now that, if, if that's not your ideal vacation. Uh, there you go. <laughs> then, you're not, then you're not a writer. Then you are not a that's writer. Right. <laughs> you probably yeah. write that off as a business expense, too. What were you doing? Um, talking? Oh, well, you know. You know, one of the, one of the most interesting things I think that's uh, happened here with Dave and I working together is um, remember the Circle of Rain and Altar of Influence were already released. And here I come and say, I, I want help editing this. And I think that did uh, take Dave back a little bit and say, well, they're already released, et cetera, et cetera. But I had no problem. And this is one of the neatest things about um, the self-publishing world is you can, you can, actually, you can do this, right? It's really right. easy to update a manuscript and upload it to Kindle or or to to Barnes and Noble for Nook or Kobo or iTunes or whatever iBooks. It's really easy to update a manuscript, and and maybe that's one of the neatest things um, that the those electronic platforms have given us, and also the print on demand guys like Create Space or Ingram oh, yeah. Spark. It's mm -hmm. so easy, even for a physical book. Now, yeah, the the old books are the way they are, the old physical books. But when you update a manuscript. And let's say a reader has already read the Kindle version of uh, Circle of Rain. The re-release is coming within a month to two months. And as soon as they re-download that book, they have the new the new version. You right. know, and I, I just think that the self-publishing wave has offered authors who, like me, did not have at first a um, you know a top tier editor and, and publisher uh, backing them and putting all those resources into them. It was me. Yep. And I had a story, I had a passion and a determination, but yeah, it, it certainly had weaknesses when it first came out. And I, I'm, you know, I'm proud of the original version. It, it won some awards. It hit number one on Audible and Amazon for the, uh, for the audiobook version. I, I mean, I'm proud of it, yeah. but I certainly wanted to get better. And I am grateful for this self-publishing uh, wave, I'll, I'll continue to refer to it as, that's allowed us to get better as authors and put it out there again, instead of the publisher saying, oh, we still got 100,000 books back there in the warehouse we need to sell before you update yeah, anything. Right. But like, yeah. Ah, you, know, you know, that yeah. brings, up an inter brings up an interesting point. You're talking about that. You can go back and make those changes or, or do a complete relaunch, the new product um, and things. The danger that I've experienced recently is, is if you have something you're not comfortable with, or like, for example, the best example is if you maybe you've written something that's too dark mm -hmm. and the temptation is to go back and change it in a start. Cause you know, the first, cause you gotta write with a lot of courage and bravery to write things that are maybe hard topics, but then you put it out there about six months and then you kind of run into it again. You're like, Oh, that kind of, what are people going to think of me? <laughs> and, I and killed now a puppy. You can go back and change it. You can go back and pull that out and make <clears> the <throat> language a little less, less harsh or, or, you know, and, 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 and I'm not suggesting you should do this like every day, right? Or every, Oh week. yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. but, well, but the re the rewrite with Dave though, um, it hasn't been re-released, but the rewrite led to, um, a publishing contract for me, I, I believe, was directly relevant to that. Right. W with Audible Studios for my audio rights. And and when they, um, I had a good buddy named Davis Ashura introduce me to the people at Audible Studios, and mm -hmm. he's with them as well. And when they found out, I was working with, you know, kind of a fantasy, fantasy legend like, like Dave Farland. Absolutely. They were very interested in taking a look based on that. They got the new updated mm -hmm. manuscript and, they had already seen it done very well on Audible, and but 
I really think the rewrite and a good introduction from one of their existing authors made all the difference in, in being able to they, acquire that. They see your level of dedication like that, you know, definitely get their eyes on it. They see your level of dedication and the amount of resources you're bringing to that. Well, that's what um, I was going to say is that, you you know, self-publishing is, is a fantastic uh, venue for writers that want to write and they want people to read their stuff and you don't have to you know, go through an editor that says, ah, I don't like this today. I'm not going to publish it. You can write your book and then you can publish it. Um, what I was going to say twofold is that, uh, Jacob, you have, um, you have taken the road that most authors do not take. And what I mean by that is you put, uh, eight years of yourself into this novel to write it correctly and, uh, put it out there and, on our previous show, we talked about you know how much you've invested in this story. You've invested in the covers. You invested in the audio book, and you've you've got Michael Kramer to do your narration. And you you said that I wanted the book to fail. Uh, if it was going to fail, I wanted it because of my writing, not because of any of the other things that I could fix, like the editing that or, I could control. Right. right. And. And I like that you've put so much time and effort into making your story, and now with with David, making your story the best it can be, instead of just writing a book, editing it one time, and putting it on Amazon with a snazzy cover. You've taken it upon yourself to actually make a point and say, we can do this correctly, and you don't have to throw up crap. I'll say it. There's some crap on Amazon that you know they it sells, and, and people make money off it, and that's fine. I want people to make money and, and grade on them, but you have ta- you have... You're one of the few that bring actual, like, hard, dedicated uh, time that you're putting energy into into making your the best product you can. Man, I I don't know how to do it any other way. Exactly. I mean, I I was raised by a marine. I do. I mean, our bedrooms were inspected with white gloves when I was a kid, and I used to love it. Right, <laughs> Dad dressed up in his blues and come in and inspect our bedroom. And I just um, <clears throat> I, I I just wanted to surround the book with brand names. Like Michael Kramer, um, and like the artist John Avon, who has done spectacular work for thirty years, and his covers are are fantastic. And yes, that costs money. Holy cow! Michael Kramer <laughs> was not cheap, but it was it was the value. And 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 you're, you're right. I mean, I wanted the I wanted the right people around the book, and um, I I was just very blessed to have a very quick readership before the book was even released. I released. The, the the prologue in chapter one on my Facebook page, and I spent lots of money marketing that free giveaway. People could go download the PDF, and I built fifteen thousand followers on Facebook before the book was even released. Oh wow! And that was so I think crucial, so that when the book was released, it had a very quick rise. Oh yeah. Um, and, and then you know it didn't help to have some of the brand names. I mean, people tell me they bought the book just based on the cover or just because of the narrator. Um, and, and so I, you know, then you get feedback and most of the feedback was really strong, really positive, And some of the feedback wasn't and sat there and said, you know what, there's probably some truth to that criticism. And that's about the time I started seeking out Dave Farland to do a quote unquote light edit that turned into <laughs> an awesome, that turned into an awesome rewrite, um, that, that I am even more stinking proud of. I didn't know. I, I just didn't know what was in that story. And Dave really, really helped me bring it out. Uh, Dave, you've said on a previous podcast that you have uh, uh, been intrigued by self-publishing and indie publishing. You're, you're, you're the most part are a traditional publisher, and you have been since the, I think, the late 70s. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, since... Um Actually, the late 80s. Late but, 80s, uh, okay. But yeah. Um, have you, well, after you finish the Rune Lords, do you have any any uh, thoughts of trying to indie publish yourself, or are you in that type of situation? Uh, you know, I have done some indie publishing before. My, my uh, latest novel uh, was called Nightingale. It was a young adult uh, uh, fantasy thriller that uh, won the International Book Award for Best Young Adult Novel of the Year. Congratulations. Won the Hollywood Hollywood Book Festival for Best Book of the Year, won the Next Gen Award for Best Young Adult Novel of the Year, along with a couple of other awards. Um, 
and, uh, and and I indie published that because at the time when I was looking at the young adult markets, uh, it was just when I was sh- wasn't sure that there was going to be a paper book market, you know, <laughs> in five <laughs> years. Uh, it's now almost you know four years later, and uh, yeah, we still got a paper market. Uh, but I, I just didn't think that things were healthy, and I didn't want to go uh, the traditional route with that. So I've got this big book that I published that's won all these awards. Now I'm going to uh, finish up the series and see about marketing it. But I've got to I've got to finish the Rune Lords first. But I think I'll probably go traditional with that. Uh, I did do a book on writing, my my book Million Dollar Outlines. I put that out as an indie, and that became the number one best selling book on writing on Amazon for nearly a year. Um, you know, so that was book. I have it actually. Yeah, so that was that was nice. So I've I've done a bit of indie, and uh, I'm sure that I'll do more. I'm just not sure which titles I might do it with. I think that down the line, indie publishing is going to become really big, and I think that Jacob is kind of. Uh, I like the way that he's doing it, uh, going with the audio books and hiring uh, really name talent and bringing in great cover artists. And yes, it's expensive, but the rewards for doing it the right way are, are you know, he's going to get a lot more money uh, by doing it this way than if he had, if he just thrown a book up on Amazon. Absolutely. It's true. He can build a long-term career with something he can be proud of and yeah. keep on working on it. Now, what are yeah. your thoughts? So I, Go ahead. I was going to say, so if I do it, I'll just ask Jacob how to do it. I'll just say, how did you do it? And, and let, let him the teacher be my counselor. The master. Then he could say, no, you're doing all that wrong. You start over. It's ridiculous that That's you right. did it that way. This is crap, Dave. This That's is crap. Right. I love it. You can throw it right back at me. I'll take it. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, you, you started out when your career, you started out as a science fiction author and then you went to fantasy and then you went to, you've done a couple of science fiction uh, books. And, but I think when people hear Farland, they go, oh, yeah, he's the guy who wrote the Rune Lords. Um, <clears throat> with indie publishing, it's really easy to do whatever you want because you can and that's yeah. what you want to do. Um, there's two kind of rules of thought when you, when you talk about publishing as an indie and you say, I want to be in one genre because I can build my list and write that genre. Um, but then there's also the flip side of that coin of I want to write sci-fi and I want to write a fantasy book because I've got this fantasy idea and I want to write this uh, mystery story or thriller. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on the best way to go about or, or the, 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 the best way to present yourself as a new indie author or as a new author in any venue to start out? Can, yeah. can we yeah, pause yeah. for just a second? I need to take care of something. I don't okay. want to mess with that. I need to give me one second. That's okay. That's fine. Just, just delete him. Just yeah, I'll take him out. <laughs> Chop it. Okay, right I'll go there. ahead. I'll go ahead and answer the question. Um, okay. Yeah, go for it. So, um, yeah, I I think that uh, one of the problems I had. I wrote my first novel, and uh, my editor. Sorry. Uh, I'm back. You know, I. I I won the Philip K. Dick Award and uh, Memorial Special Award, and I uh, uh, became a bestseller, hit the bestseller list for five months in science fiction. And my editor said, so, you know, you've got this book and it's done great. What do you want to do next? And I said, I want to do a big Tolkien-esque fantasy. And she says, well, you're a best-selling science fiction author. Most people take 20 years to get, you know, where, where you got with one, you know. We don't want any fantasy from you. And so for the next 10 years, I kept writing science fiction that edged closer and closer to fantasy. Uh, (laughs) And if I were indie publishing, I just would have gone ahead and written the fantasy novel. But I think that the, the real key is to figure out what it is that you love. Because let's face it, when you're writing fantasy or science fiction or something like that, and uh, and you're trying to push it big, and you're doing all of the marketing yourself. You're doing all of the all of the uh, hard work of of editing audio tapes and things like that. Um, it it it's really a huge job, and you you don't want to mess around in multiple genres. I think you want to find an audience, build that audience, and go wild with it. I think there's a time in your career when you you know, you've been working at it for 20 years or something where you can say, okay, now I can experiment and go do something else, you know, but, uh, um, and, and maybe there's certain novels that just sort of demand to be written. You know, I don't always believe in writing for money. I believe that there are times when a, an idea hits you 
And, you know, I've never written a cop novel, okay? I've never written a detective novel. My brother's a detective. I was a prison guard. My grandfather was in the mafia. You know, I've got all sorts of ideas for detective novels, and uh, I just never have written any one of them. But maybe someday in my doddering old age, I'll write one. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Dave, I've got a question for you based on that. Um, so my the, – the, Josh and Scott know this. My wife uh, challenged me to write a paranormal romance. Uh huh. And I said, no way. And she kept <laughs> bugging me. She said, if, uh, finally, I said, tell you what, if you outline it, knowing she never would, if you outline it, I'll write it. <laughs> Famous last well, she, words. She, she outlined it. Nice. At, at uh -huh. least a good, a good part of it. Now I'm 30,000 words into this thing. And, um,. I uh, I've really to toiled toiled with the idea: should I release it under my name or not? It's werewolf and romance and that kind of thing, you know. And I I've kind of decided now nah, I'm not going to release it under my name, but I don't want to not have the uh, momentum of my existing audience. And I think using my existing audience, I think there's a good number of people that would just buy it because it's me. Yeah. But then, then I don't want to disenfranchise them. You, you see my schizophrenia yeah. problem. What do no, you think? I, I I, I think um, between you and me, I probably wouldn't do it, okay? It's just too far outside of my interest level and my comfort level, you know? Um, I'm going to stick with what I really feel like I, I'm fascinated by and, and hope that, you know, my existing readers will be fascinated by it too. I think that might be a little bit too much of a diversion, to just be honest with you. If would you say just don't release it at all, or would you say if I do release it under a pen name? I Re think doing pen names. Oh. Pen names are great. Okay, really you could release it under David Keith Harlan. Keith Michelson. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, Josh. I think you. you should release <laughs> under your your pen name, especially if it's really really crazy. It should be Josh Hayes. You could. Oh yeah. You could, uh -huh. you that's Josh a winner. That's a good pen name right there. <laughs> it shows up on Amazon. I'm like, I didn't write this. Why, why is my picture on there? <laughs> what is this going on here? Why yeah. do I keep getting all these emails? And all these checks. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, yeah. That would, yeah. yeah, I guess I'd be okay. Yeah, I'd be good with the checks. <laughs> Let's see. Well, uh, we're coming up on the hour, I think. Um, we've been talking for, what, an hour and five minutes, I think. Is, and that's uh, – it's. I've had a really good time with the conversation. Um, I think we've covered a lot of topics. Is there anything that uh, jumps out at you guys that you want to chat about? Yeah, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about editing, and there's different kinds of editors and different kinds of editing. And I think a lot of problem that new writers have is that when they think of editing, they think I need somebody to come in and make sure that you know things are capitalized properly, and we get your my commas in the right places. And I mean, that's like a proofreader, that. right? I mean, that's a proof yeah, reader, that's right? a proofreader. That's that's line editing, and it's the simplest yeah. level, and you can hire just about anybody to do that. But then there's other people. There are people who handle, you know, look at the consistency and the story editing. There are people who are acquisitions editor. An acquisitions editor looks at something and says, I know the market. I know who you're writing for. I understand what it takes. This is what you have to do to be one of the best in this field. And so finding a person who can do an acquisitions edit properly, somebody who can uh, go through and knows how to edit your story. You know, that's a that's a different kind of editor. And that's why people like me are lots of money. So only people like Jacob with lots of money come to us. That's uh, right. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a lot harder than just doing a simple proof edit. I'll just put it that way. Um, but but I think that uh, there's there's just so few people who understand how um, how complex the process can be. You know, you, you mentioned triage editing. Triage editing is where I look at something and I say, Okay, we need to cut this. You need to, uh, you need to cut this scene or this character. We need to go through and, uh, or maybe this entire storyline, and we need to go through and uh, uh, combine these two scenes because you have the same action happening twice. So we need to go through and uh, add this because you don't have this happening at the end, and, and this should happen. You know, so uh, uh, that kind of editing, you know is the kind of thing that goes well above what most proofreaders are capable of. If you go hire somebody down at the, uh, like, say, your local newspaper to come in and edit your novel, they may not have any expertise in your field at all. They may just be reading their very first science fiction novel and trying to give it the best edit they can, and they may not be very good. So when you do look for an editor, I would just recommend that you understand that you know, there, are, there are different levels of editing, 
and know what it is you're looking for. If you don't want somebody to do a triage edit, if you don't want somebody who's going to do an acquisitions edit, if you don't want somebody who's going to do a story edit, you just want a proofreader, go hire a cheap proofreader, okay? Because I don't like proofreading. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll say that one of the best things about my, my experience with Dave was the, um, I, I got the first 100 pages back from him edited, and then he told me, take that and see what I've done. And I, I went through every single change. And, you know, I, I think 95% of all the changes Dave made, I, I agreed with and accepted. But then he told me to go ahead of him. And so I would go ahead using those same style of edits and the, the, the finding where I was telling instead of showing, finding the passive voice and, you know, the things that, that he had done. And I would go forward for 30 to 50 pages and then send it to him and he'd continue to polish and edit and and anyway, my, my what I was doing was much more a little bit story editing, but also uh, proofreading and grammatical editing and things like that. And then I'd send that to Dave. So it was at a higher level. And I did that for most of the novel. And then near the end, I, I kind of got behind and Dave got ahead of me. <laughs> um, but but I, I will say this, Dave, you, you did not like my final battle as it uh, existed. And that's what I got the most praise for was that final battle for <laughs> most reviewers most reviewers and uh, I'll say that the the thing you had a problem with was you thought I was just telling and describing the action much more than showing it and the, again the reader wasn't really in it um, and so, so I took that final battle and broke it up so much into different chunks and now I I would uh, I, I think you'd be very proud of that final battle i i just get so amped up reading it now and uh anyway those are the kind of things i among many that i learned uh through this rewrite process yeah i think the goal as a, a an editor you know when i when i edit a book i don't want to i don't want to just edit the book i want to i want to help teach you how to be a better writer and i i like the fact that jacob was willing to say okay you know let's go ahead and do this and i really could see um, you know, from that first hundred pages uh, on through the next few hundred pages, you know, where you had gone through and done the edit, I could really see the growth and the difference, you know, as we got further and further into it. And then when we got to that final battle scene, I actually liked the battle scene, by the way. Uh, I just, I, I, but, but I wanted to push you harder. I always want to push you to be your best. Okay. And that meant that any place where I saw that I thought it could be better, I would just say, okay, I think you could do this better. And so let's try this, you know. And, and it was uh, good. And, and you did. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, uh, I had a, uh, an old supervisor in the Air Force that when I was testing for, uh, nobody cares, Josh. Senior Airman, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> shut up. I'm going to tell the story. Uh, when I, when the I was, story. when I was testing for Senior Airman, he kept telling, kept telling me that I was failing the test because he would give me the test. And every time he'd say, you're failing. Uh, you need to study oh, and do wow. better. And he'd get really mad at me. And I'm like, man, I, I feel like I'm studying and I feel like I'm doing better. But so I did that for several months. And when I went and took the test, I aced it at a hundred percent. And I said, man, I, I was really hurting. And he was like, you aced your first test. I just want, <laughs> I just wanted you to keep studying. Cause I didn't want to tell you that you were doing good and then slack off for two months before the test came. So, uh, yeah, I, I had a professor that did that in college, and he, he would give you, when you were in his class, if he gave you an A, it meant that you were good. If he gave you a B, it meant that you were good and he thought you could do better. And so I called that an inspirational B. And I remember, uh, for example, when I was editing Stephanie Meyer's final short stories for the class, and I looked at him and I thought, man, this girl could be dangerous. You know, she's got a world-class voice. You know, do I give her an A or do I give her a B? Ooh. You know, <laughs> I still can't remember what I gave her. You know, oh, come on. I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to push her. I didn't want it, but I didn't want to crush her, you know, because I wasn't known for doing that, you know. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a great way to teach, you know. Uh, you keep pushing them, keep pushing them until they think they're going to break, and then you keep pushing them further. To keep on the, uh, the theme of uh, the episode and kind of wrap it up, um, what would be before sending your manuscript to either a, an editor that you're paying or an editor that you're submitting to before sending your finished book off, what would be the number one, uh, thing that you would tell an author to do to that manuscript? If they think it's ready to send, 
what would you tell them to do the, the last thing before they send it off? Wait three days. Okay. Every time that I send a manuscript off to an editor, um, I'll send it and I'll put it, I used to put it in the mailbox and immediately I think, oh, wait a minute, I, I was going to say this in that last chapter and oh, I need to do this. And, and you know, after three or four days, um, I, I had a, a list of 50 things I wanted to do. Uh, I think a lot of people just get in a little bit too much of a rush. Excellent. Absolutely cool. Okay. You mail it to yourself. Yeah, man. Back <laughs> oh, I kind of mailed it to myself and not my editor. Saved it. There you go. Uh, well, Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your uh, vacation type in Australia. Uh, Jacob, again, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Always Likewise, guys. a good time. Likewise. Uh, for Scott and everybody else here at Keystroke Medium, I'm Josh Hayes. You've been watching The Right Stuff, and we'll see you guys on the next show. Thanks for watching.